it, it's about the message. It's about the fight. And we need people to get involved with that to understand it. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, for Captains for Clean Water, it's more than just wearing the hat. Like, you have to believe in what's going on. You have to be passionate about, you know, believing in what the fight is all about. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin story? Too much alcohol. Really? Okay. Because <laughs> if God wanted us to have fiberglass boats, he would have given us fiberglass trees. It's, it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit as yeah. far as if I can remember uh -huh. correctly. <laughs> What's up, guys? This is Leo here from Billfish. We're back for another episode of State of Sport Fishing. Today, we're joined by Matt George and Benny Blanco from Captains for Clean Water. Matt, Benny, how are you doing tonight? How are you, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. Yep. Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So, you know, if, unless you've been living under a rock, Captains for Clean Water is an amazing organization. Um, I'll actually let Benny, Benny, I'll let you speak more about it, to be honest. I'm not going to give a summarized intro because it, it doesn't do it justice. Um, so, Benny, tell us a little bit more about yourself. So, how how did you get into fishing? Um, how how did you get into all this? Sure. So I I uh, was born was born and raised in South Florida, and um, you know like every other kid in the late seventies and early eighties, you know water was the outlet. Um, there was water everywhere: um, lakes, canals, beaches, inshore, offshore. And for me, um, I just wanted to be on the water. So I knew I was going to be a fisherman. Um, have some type of career around the water at an early age. I didn't know what, what it was. I didn't honestly didn't even know what guides were when I was young. Um, I just needed to be around it, in it, involved somehow. For me, the offshore thing was such a huge question mark because it was inaccessible for me. I didn't have a boat. I didn't have anybody in my family who had a boat. Um, so when I had opportunities to go offshore, I went. And um, I mean, it was um, incredible. Blue water and sailfish and my, I remember Mahi being literally every every trip it was it was it's incredible were you um, were you mating were you mating on on charter boats in miami or was it just a private boat i did some mating here and there um i quickly found that the offshore scene wasn't exactly what i was in love with um i think it was more water that drew me um certainly when i was really young the mahi and the sailfish were an incredible species because they were big and plentiful and um we we ate mahi, so it was nice to bring home food for the for the family. But um, but I quickly realized after meeting a couple couple seasons that I needed to be inshore. Inshore was my thing. Um, but the water always called me. I was I'm a South Floridian through and through. Um, you know, I literally was always searching for water, some type of outlet, whether like I said, whether it be a canal, a lake, a, a flat, or getting on somebody's big boat and going catch mahi or sailfish. Um, I just wanted to be on the water. So I am like most other kids who grew up in South Florida, just a, a water kid. You know, we, we, we all want to be near the water in some form or fashion and look, look any ramp on a Saturday and Sunday and everybody's called to the water. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was no different. Okay. Who did you fish with when we went offshore? Any people that, that kind of are in the sailfish circuit that we know? Yeah. I fished a lot with bouncer. Um, okay. I fished with Jimmy Lewis a couple of times and, I spent a lot of time with Bouncer. Bouncer was, Bouncer was was great. Um, he was happy to answer the fifty thousand questions I had, and <laughs> and you know entertain a little kid who was just completely over enthused. Probably drove him nuts. Um, but he was happy to answer all those questions. And and man, I, um, at the time there weren't a lot of offshore guides that were like that, and so it was nice to have somebody like that with that kind of stature and knowledge base to to share and, and ask, answer questions. Okay. Did, did you ever meet Nick at all? Our, our, our co-host in this podcast? I have not. No. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay, cool. So you, you started off in the offshore and how did it, and how was the transition to inshore? Um, it was actually pretty easy. You know, inshore was very accessible for me because um, back then, not all of the flats access was private. Um, you could, I could ride my bike to, a shoreline on Biscayne Bay and wade for hours and catch bonefish and permit and tarpon. And, um, I thought that was pretty normal for most kids. I, I thought, you know, anybody could go out and do that. And I, what I didn't realize is we had this world-class fishery that was accessible to everybody at, at that time. Um, but I fell completely in love with it. I, it just, it was, um, 
very technical. It was very one-on-one. -on -one. It was very challenging. It was um, constant development of skills. Like I was, I was drawn to that. And, um, and so I found Inshore and the story goes on and on and on from there. I, I got a, I got a John boat. I found the glades you know, I, I bought a skiff and I mean, it, all roads lead to me being a guide, um, 25 years now, um, fishing every major tournament, speaking up at every major event. Um, fishing is, is more than my life. It, it is who I am. Mm -hmm. No, that's really cool. Okay. And what, when, how would you say inshore fishing relates to offshore fishing? What are our kind of similarities and discrepancies? Well, the similarities are obvious. Uh, fishing is fishing. Yeah. Um, I have offshore buddies who are as ed addicted and committed to catching fish offshore as I am inshore. They are extremely technical and they base all of their, their game plans on, on what I refer to as science. I'm, I mean, it's not science in the typical sense and it's in a book and published documents. It's, it's the science that every fisherman knows, you know, the, the wind direction versus the Gulf stream direction versus the knots versus the d temperature of the water and all those things that we do inshore, you guys do offshore. Uh, my, my fishing is slightly different um, in the sense that I, I am, I am more relying on a sight fishing aspect. Um, I'm a sight fisherman through and through. I would rather see one fish and catch it than catch 50, you know, pulling baits. Um, but that doesn't make my fishing any better or worse than offshore. It's just different. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's what calls me. Um, but I have offshore buddies who do it and don't like it, don't want anything to do with it. And we would much rather drag a bait and catch 15 fish and, and man, more power, more power to them. Honestly, we, we need to spread out in the water. We can't all be inshore fishermen. We can't all be offshore fishermen. Um, but we, what we can do is fight for the water equally because we all love the water equally. And, uh, and that's why I'm here to talk to you today. Yeah. It's a beautiful segue to get into it. So tell us a little bit more about, about captains for clean water. Yeah, sure. So captains derived from an absolute need for outdoorsmen to speak up for the water and the woods and the wild places that we love. We For decades, a hundred plus years, the environment has taken a backseat to progress. Progress, you know, in loose quotations, um, draining of the swamp and, and providing um, agricultural land and building more buildings. And everywhere you look, there's concrete, concrete. And everything we do inshore affects what, what happens offshore. Um, and, you know, unfortunately for me, because I'm an inshore fisherman, the inshore fishermen see the degradation first. We, we, we experience the water quality degradation immediately. The result of that water quality degradation is loss of habitat. The result of, the result of loss of habitat is loss of forage fish and game fish. And, and it goes, the domino effect doesn't stop to the extent that it rolls right into the offshore world. Um, you guys wonder why there's no bait? I can tell you, I just <laughs> described it. You guys wonder why there's more offshore fishermen today than, than yesterday? I can tell you because the inshore fishing is tough mm -hmm. and the habitat's gone and, the, and our fisheries are degraded. So um, whether, I mean, and there's a million other connect, connecting the dots uh, scenarios that I can describe, but, um, you know, Captain's was, was born out of that need, that need for, for, someone to stand up and speak up and tell the politicians, the legislators that those special interests, those lobbyists that are telling them to go one way are wrong. And that in the state of Florida, especially, um, tourism, our, our, our economy is tourism based. I mean, we, our recreational fishing in the state of Florida is over $30 billion of annual economic activity. That's like 40% of the recreational fishing G, uh, um, ec economic activity in the country. Florida is tourism based. So in no way, shape or form should in Florida ever consider building or rerouting water before considering what, what's best for the environment. And the environment is all we have here. Unless we're all going to be farmers in 20 years. I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, I know thousands of fishermen that are, that want to stand up and speak up. And that's what, that's what captains is about. Um, captains is about giving the outdoorsmen that platform to, use their voice to speak passionately, to tell relatable stories about what's going on in the water right now, not what's on that scientific paper that was handed to them by a lobbyist, um, explaining what the degradations, what, what's, what the degradation is resulting uh, in our waterways, inshore and offshore, 
and making holding those account those legislators accountable you know they, they in many cases they're they want to do the right thing but money leads them in other directions and the only thing that is more powerful than money in tallahassee and in dc is votes and so when i come to this podcast and i talk to matt and i'm talking to you i, I, I am i'm not asking for anybody's money i'm not asking for anybody's time I'm asking you to just understand that our water is connected and that if we don't speak up for it, we will lose it. And uh, it's happening in, in, in front of our eyes right now. Where the reality we? is, sorry, go ahead. Are there certain like locations that you that have kind of felt it harder than, than others? Um, I would like to say yes. Um, but the reality is every single fishery uh, up and down the coast is in degradation, major degradation. Um, and we're losing fisheries faster than we can recover them. Um, and here, you know, the re here, the most important thing we can do today is understand where we are in history. 30 years ago, we thought it was unlimited. We thought, you know, the water could never be bad and fishing is, you know, there's mahi for, for, for days and, and there's redfish for days and the tarpon will always swim down the line. And what we're finding out now is that's not the case. And we do not have another 30 years. This this is our time to speak up or forever hold our peace. And I don't know about you, man, but I am I don't know what I would do on this planet if I didn't have the water that I fish and the people that would come here to fish on my skiff. Uh, I don't know what I would do. And so I'm fighting for it like my life depended on it because it absolutely does. Yeah, and there's there's a big misunderstanding too, Leo, about water, right? You have a lot of people that come from other places in North America that come to F South Florida, and they see the pretty blue water, and right away it's oh, it's beautiful, the water's warm, I want to get in it, but it's dead. It's it's a barren desert right now, like Leo or like um, Benny was saying that the habitat is gone. You know, everything that the the smaller fish when they reproduce need to survive is no longer there anymore. And, you know, even up here in Stewart, the, the, some of the fish that we used, used to catch inshore, we now catch on offshore reefs because that's the only place they can go to reproduce or, or to, to raise their young. So, um, you know, that's a big misunderstanding. And that is one of the reasons why it's important to get kind of that national exposure for what's actually going on with the water. Because a lot of the people that are saying the water's beautiful and it's great are all the same people that live on the water. They have home waterfront homes and they look at that pretty blue water every day. But, you know, 10, 15 years ago, even more, I've been here for a short 13 years. So I didn't even see it in my time. Um, but these rivers used to be the flats used to be filled with grass and there's just nothing anymore. It's just barren sand. So, you know, there's a big misunderstanding about about the water as well. And that's kind of what we're what, the message we're trying to get out there. Hmm. Okay. And beautifully said, when you say degradation of the water, can you give like kind of ex more specific examples of how you're seeing that? Sure. I mean, there's, there are quite a few, but there's one that recently hit last week. Um, there was a, uh, a report issued by Florida International University, um, the Water Resources Lab, the lab that my oldest daughter actually works in right now. Um, they tested redfish which is a common sport fish in all the flats all around the state of Florida. They tested redfish at, in every major fishery in the state of Florida. And every single redfish they tested, tested positive for pharmaceuticals. So um, wow. that's one example. So if, and I know that's a big deal for the offshore community because they, you know, that they're more of a, a catch and keep um, uh, fishery management situation than, than inshore. Um, inshore, I mean, it's that's a huge, huge blow because redfish is one of the species that everybody targets for um, for food. And um, what that means is that our, our the baseline forage for all of our game fish is is at risk. Um, you know, they test positive for opioids and birth control and all these incredible things that I, I will, you know, they will have an effect on future fisheries. and. Um, that's just one example. The, the second example is, you know, I, I, I built my entire business on site fishing in Florida Bay. Florida Bay is the bay that, that lies between Everglades National Park and the Florida Keys. It's the bay where, where saltwater fly fishing was born, where over 60% of the permit bonefish and tarpon rec world records existed. 
And in that bay in the year 2015, which was just eight years ago, less than eight years ago, we lost 50,000 acres of seagrass literally overnight because we've rerouted the, fre the fresh water coming out of Lake Okeechobee through the Everglades. And so that bay basically is hyper saline all the time, which means it's, it's saltier than seawater all the time. And anytime there's any kind of drought, we have algal blooms and the algal blooms result in grass die offs, um, fish rerouting fish behavior. Uh, the tarpon don't even come into Florida Bay most of the time anymore. Um, these are just, just examples. There's a million up and down the state of Florida. Literally every fishery you go into, there is an, there's a blaring example of what we've done to the water and the effects that fishermen see first. Um, because like Matt just pointed out perfectly, you know, the guys who moved here from Nebraska to buy their dream home on the, on the water and spend millions of dollars, their entire, you know, retirement fund, um, they, they buy this beautiful home and they look at the blue water and they have no, they have their baseline is what they're looking at. That's why it's so important that every fisherman who's got any time on the water in Florida speak up because, if you if we rely on the people who live here now, which as everyone knows is fifty at least fifty percent people from every other state in the union in the country, um, they have no idea that their baseline is is what they're looking at. And I can tell you for sure, I've been guiding twenty five years, and um, everything has changed. Everything has changed. And the young fishermen who are going out there today think it's amazing, and I'm happy that they think it's amazing. But if if I told them what really they were missing, they probably not want to do it. Yeah. And so it's really important that we, um, as fishermen, as outdoorsmen, that we, that we speak up about what we've experienced in our lifetimes, because that's what we're fighting for. We're not fighting to catch fish tomorrow. We're fighting to restore it back to what we, at least a portion of what we remember and what we've seen in the past decade, couple decades. And, uh, and that's absolutely possible. There's examples of that everywhere uh, all across the country where, outdoorsmen and and communities have spoken up they've corrected the wastewater stormwater issues they've corrected the water re rerouting issues and fisheries bounce back they bounce back the environment bounces back so well um we're just not giving it an opportunity and you know frankly there's not enough people interested in what's going on for us to make a real impact and that's why cats is so important we act we're breaking down doors we're removing the obstacles we're we're forming relationships in Tallahassee and DC that are critical for us to make these, have these conversations and, and make these people understand that this is important. This is important for Florida's future. It's important for my future. It's important for everyone that I love in my community. And, um, and it's and the offshore community doesn't want to find out when it's too late. And so right now it's not too late right now. We, if we work together, we can absolutely reroute this problem. And um, it's, it's like I said, if, if we don't start speaking up for it, I promise you that no one will. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reality of it is there will end up being nothing left. So there won't be generations to come. There, there just won't be anything left for anyone. And that's the sad part. So, you know, as much as, um, you know, people think it's not going to happen in their lifetime, it's, it's already happened in, you know, in Benny's lifetime. Um, again, my short time here in South Florida, I've seen a big change. I mean, I used to love fishing for snook and would just watch the way that, you know, snook would get beat up during their breeding time, um, in the, in the spring and early summer. And, you know, just decided after you catch one fish and it's got two hooks hanging about out of its mouth and three sores in its mouth, it's just not worth it, you know, for, for, you know, just like Benny, I'm, I'm passionate. Um, if there was no, no, uh, Instagram or anything else, I'd still be out there grinding every day and doing what I do because it's what, what I'm passionate about, what I love. But if we don't pay attention to it and we don't get people educated on what's truly going, there's just not going to be anything left for anyone. And that's, that's sad. You know, I, I, I have kids, I have older kids now that eventually are going to have their own kids. And, um, you know, I try to make sure I beat it into their heads, but there's a lot of education that needs to be done and there needs to be a lot more people to get involved and take it serious because it's, it's real. Sorry. My dog is going crazy over here. No worries. <laughs> what, what are, let me ask you something, Benny. Um, and I, sorry for the, the, all the questions. I just, all good. I just, I just find it very interesting. Um, and I hope you take it as a, as a, as, as just me being interested. What are legislative actions that the folks up in DC can take to help this? 
Uh, well, there's a there are a couple right now, but there's always something, and it and it varies throughout throughout the years. But right now, we've got the farm bill that's up. Half of my team from Captain for Clean Water is up there right now with members from Orvis and the Everglades Foundation fighting for Everglades restoration funding. Um, the Everglades restoration plan is a federal cross share plan. So um, through DeSantis and all of our all of our hard advocacy work in Florida, we've got we've moved Florida's needle beyond any part of it's, our imagination. It's been inspiring to see. Yeah, we've had record funding commitments, record permit uh issuances we've had uh the new district um the board for the district has been is incredible we went from when we first started fighting there was like two projects of the 68 online or 67 online two projects in 20 years in the in the last seven years now right now there's over 54 projects online and um including the big one that we just got a month or so ago we just broke we just cut the ribbon on um the reservoir that's south of lake of Okeechobee. um but the governor's committed 3.5 billion dollars in his next four years um and so now we're up in tallahassee and dc right now advocating for the federal component the federal share of that that 3.5 billion over the next four years and um it's unfortunately something we have to go fight for every single year i mean it's it's imagine it's like it's like having you're building your own home right and Every month you decide this month, I'm going to give a hundred bucks. The next month, I'm going to give a hundred thousand dollars. The month of that, I'm going to give $10. Like no contractor is going to ever finish your house if that's what your funding is. So we have to fight every single year to get the funding commitments from the state and from, and from the federal government so that we can continue that progress. Now there's nothing worse than getting something close to being done and then not having the funding to finish it. And then, and then in that period of time we're, where you have the delay in funding, the permits change and the requirements change and the cost for construction changes. It's like this constant battle. And um, if we didn't exist, if if our organization wasn't up there fighting all the time, this this literally would never happen. Um, and the Glades, Everglades Restoration accounts for several major fisheries from Stewart to Key West, all the way back up to um, Boca Grande. And on the West Coast. So we're talking about the entire southern tip of Florida. Um, but all this work we've done uh, advocating and, and um, you know, speaking to politicians in Tallahassee and Tallahassee is opening doors for every other fishery, every other water quality issue in the state of Florida. Um, it's offshore, offshore issues too. Uh, I was recently with the Miami Waterkeeper um, fighting for uh, reef issues in, in Day County. And um, you know, those those issues are on the table because captains made it a point that water is a crucial component to Florida's economy. And if we weren't fighting for what we know and love in the glades, those doors would never be open. We would never be able to have those conversations. So um, right now we're fighting for the farm bill. We're fighting for seven hundred twenty five million dollars from the federal government for this year to, as a cost share for for the state of Florida. And if that happens, then this major sense of urgency and all these projects that we have going on will We'll see it through. And, um, you know, we're so dang close in everybody's restoration to getting over the hump where things are just actually flowing and we don't have to fight so much. And then we can focus on a lot of other, a lot of other fisheries in the state of Florida too. But um, the, the ask in, the, in, in DC is, is constantly changing. Um, but that's why we need organizations like captains. We have, we have people who are constantly on the watch for what's going on, constantly telling us when we have to be someplace to, to go speak up. And, you know, we're fishermen. We want to be on the water. And then, so if, if I'm on the water every single day, I can't, I can't fight for what's going on in D.C. and Tallahassee. So we, we need to have organizations that, that represent us, that are made up of guides, that are made up of fishermen, outdoorsmen, who, who are going to fight for it passionately and tell us when there's a problem and there's a call to action. And, and God, if, if we get off the water and there's a call to action, send the email, make the call. It takes five, ten minutes max. And the difference is black and white. Understood. Um, and what what can the offshore community to help? How can we assist? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great question. Um, the offshore community just needs to pay attention to what's going on with captains. Um, there's a ton of information out. Um, I think the biggest gap between what's going on with captains and the inshore community and what we're fighting for and the offshore community is that there is there's a basic disconnect between 
understanding that it is their fight too. Can you can you explain can you explain one more time just so you understand like yeah. why it is their fight as well? I think it's important yeah. that we I just mean, keep hammering it. For oh, sure. Ask, ask any ask any sport fish boat captain right now when he's out there on the weekend or during a tournament and he's got to deal with a bunch of bay boats under his riggers, under his kites, that kind of stuff, right? I've been guilty of Yeah, I was about that. to say. I was about <laughs> to say. <laughs> I, I've been I've been guilty of that, but I mean, in if you think about it, um you know, I've been um, I've been getting involved with captains for uh, a few years now. In the beginning, you know, I felt like it was you know uh, uh, an organization that was that was fighting for some things, but I didn't quite understand exactly what they were doing. And I would say over the last probably five years, I really got a good understanding, and you know, tried to partner up with those guys to do what I could to you know help out and have my voice heard. But you know, I've seen it to where. Um, it's gotten to the point where people would look at it and say, oh, you know, caps for clean water. It's a cool hat, but it's, it's so much more than a hat. You know, it's, it's the, the people don't, the, they don't understand exactly what these guys are truly fighting for and how it affects their fishery too. And it does affect everything that they're doing. It, it affects their livelihood, the charter boat captains. It affects, you know, the, the waterfront owners. It, it affects everyone. And, you know, those guys need to pay attention to it. Generally, you know, I'll say it, I'll go on the limb, you know, generally that sport fish crowd, those guys have deeper pockets. Those guys are able to get more involved and help to make a difference and help to move the needle. Um, if they truly knew what was going on in their backyard or truly knew what was about to happen to their fishery in some time, you know, I think they would want to get more involved in fight and, and be a part of what's going on. And it doesn't take much. I mean, I've always been an offshore guy through and through. I mean, to my core, that's where I've started. Um, very much like Benny, always attracted the water, you know, from a young age, riding my bike four miles in one direction, just to fish a pond. Because um, I grew up kind of inland before I moved to uh, to uh, to the beach. But um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's 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 really going to take everybody to get involved and and to support what's going on and, and have their voices heard because um, if they take a deep look at it, it is affecting them too. And, you know, the, the quickest thing I could say is ask the guys, you know, in the last five years or three years, how many more little boats are they having to contend with offshore when before they had it all to themselves? Because there's just not much to fish for inshore anymore. Or people are starting, the inshore crowd is starting to understand what's going on and they're starting to feel like I did and not want to, you know, beat up on a fish that's already under so much pressure as it is and try to go chase something else and fish for something different. And that's, you know, what's caused me to, to move more offshore and do, do the things that I'm doing. So, um, you know, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, Leo, but, you know, the, the, the thing is people need to get involved, pay attention to what's going on, and it's, it's not difficult to do. Would I mean, I've say, been to – Would you say poor – Poor waste management in general is outside of just the United States, right? For example, as from an offshore crowd, I know that there's a massive problem with sargasm. And I am not a marine biologist. And what I'm about to say could be complete speculation or completely, completely not true. But there is a massive issue with sargasm that like even the DR a few years ago, like you'd see lobsters and stuff come up from the depths and just float up because there's no oxygen in the water, right? Would you say that's also because of poor waste management on a global scale, not just in America? I, th I think the sargasm issue comes from uh, warming seas um, mm -hmm. and, and different flows in the Gulf Stream that's that's unrelated to the issues we have inshore, but it's okay. it's a compounding effect. Mm -hmm. You know, for the, for the inshore, you know, the, the sargasm collects on the shoreline. And um, when the sargasm collects, it, it decays and releases all those nutrients in the water on the shoreline, which affects the bait fish. And there's other species, offshore species that the offshore guides absolutely lit, lit, uh, need to survive, like snapper and grouper and mackerel that rely on the inshore fisheries. And um, as the inshore fisheries degrade, those fisheries are going to degrade. And in, and then what happens when there's no bait uh, in in the areas like Stewart and Fort Pierce and Jupiter, the, the sailfish and those migratory fish, the mahi, they're not going to stop. They're just going to keep going until they get to the bait. 
Um, this is this is not rocket science. I don't need to, buy, need to be a biologist to understand that two plus two equals four. That's happening right now. Every offshore fisherman that I know um, is struggling to catch to catch their own bait, to find bait, to you know on a regular basis. It's I remember when I was a kid, bait was not a problem. There was bait everywhere. I, it was I could go. I mean, I, I never worried about having bait when I went offshore. Um, I never worried about catching a snapper. I never worried about catching a grouper. Every spot that I had, there was always snapper and grouper and tons of bait and mackerel everywhere, mackerel on the bridges. Now it's a different different state of affairs. It's very difficult to find bait. Um, inshore, it's very difficult to find snapper and grouper. Um, and that's the thing is, we have to remember that the inshore fishermen are the canary in the coal mine. We see it first. And so if we're telling you that there's a there's a problem and it's coming towards you, you don't want to wait till the problem hits you because I promise you it's going to be way worse at that point. And so um, the connectivity is is more than just having more inshore fishermen offshore. And that's a major problem. It's it's a problem for me in the glades. Um, we have red tide up the west coast of Florida. And so a bunch of guides are displaced. They have to make a living. They have to feed their families. And they're in my fishery fishing putting pressure additional pressure on a fishery that can only handle so much and so that's going to happen offshore for sure you're going to have guys like matt in your spread trying to catch your sailfish um and um I, you know we're, we're we're fishermen we 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 are outdoorsmen we love the water the same the offshore guys love the water just like we do they just need to understand that the problem is theirs too we've already broken the doors down we've already removed some of the hurdles we've already we already have the platform there for us to get educated, to be able to spread the message, and to actually make positive change, we just need them to get involved. Get involved. Start, let's just listen to some of the stuff, learn a little bit about what's going on. When there's a call to action, when there's an opportunity to come uh, meet some of us, when there's an opportunity to speak up, by all means, use that that opportunity. The more of us that speak up, the more of us that become educated, the more people that we we touch and talk to about what's going on. The, the better our chances are of actually affecting change and the sooner the better because you know i talked about how the fisheries can bounce back and the environment is very resilient well it's only resilient and can only bounce back to a certain point we don't want to get to that point we don't know when that tipping point is we just know that we're close and if we don't start acting now we're going to find out really soon okay platforms we should be utilizing them to get the message out to get people involved um you know, these things tend to, for social media, they can become something that is a trend or a fad. Uh, but it's it's more than the trend or a fad, right? It, it's about the message. It's about the fight. And we need people to get involved with that to understand it. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, for Captains for Clean Water, it's more than just wearing the hat. Like, you have to believe in what's going on. You have to be passionate about, you know, believing in what the fight is all about because that's truly what it's about and uh yeah we need to get this out to lots of other people so yep, this has been sure. great leo you can you can definitely count on me for anything um okay. any educational <laughs> component i mean it's it's honestly what i do i'm on the water 250 to 300 days a year somewhere in there depending on how many legislative issues we have in tallahassee and dc that year <laughs> but um every other waking day i'm I'm doing this. I'm speaking up and um, building a platform and educating and, you know, putting, injecting myself whenever, wherever possible to speak and educate people. So I'm in hundred percent people listening to this podcast can absolutely go, should absolutely right now go to captainsforcleanwater.org. There's a ton of information there about what's, what our fight is, how we, how we started, what, what we're working on right now. And I mean, I, if you go to the, that website, and you read what's going on and you don't feel empowered and feel like there's some, there's a, a, there's a way for you to speak up and use your voice, then I quit because any fisherman <laughs> in the state of Florida gets it immediately. The second way I start talking to them, they understand and they want to get involved. And I think it's really just about connecting the dots for them. And um, that's why I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you, Leo, to speak to the people who are listening. Um, you know, Captains for Clean Water is just an avenue for us. It's a platform for us to rally as outdoorsmen, um, not inshore, not offshore, not hunters, not just fishermen, all of us, the people mm -hmm. who love Florida, who love the water, who love the outdoors in Florida, we we have to speak up for it. This is our, our opportunity. This is our platform. Go to captorscleanwater.org, learn what's going on, 
And then there's from there, there's a ton of ways to get involved. Um, but the first thing you got to do is, is understand what's going on and that's how you do it. Okay. Awesome. I think that, I think this, this podcast episode may be insignificant to some, but I personally see it as, as sort of the, the moment that at least us as a brand and as a community that we, that who we are, we start kind of moving for this and really kind of get this moving. Um, it's been really awesome for me to hear all the stories. Um, again, I've always, I've been guilty of, you know, I've seen it from afar and I love leadership and I, I, it's amazing. Right. But like you said, it's far from home. So it's a little bit, you know, it's far from home, but just to see this and, and hear your story and hear the story behind captains and how it relates to offshore, I think it's really powerful. Um, and yeah, you can count you. on Bellfish to do whatever we can to, to assist. And yeah, I want to talk to, to some of the VRs that we work with and, I personally believe in storytelling. I think that nothing rallies humans more than storytelling. I think yeah. for the longest time on the planet, like nothing has, has, I mean, storytelling has moved man to the moon and, and, and that's, that's the drive that kind of forces people to act. Right. Um, and I love the story. I mean, the story is beautiful and, and the passion is beautiful and just seeing everyone together in DC and on the photos. I mean, it's, it's amazing. There's nothing that's, sort of amazing. So, so, Something to be said when you're when you go to Tallahassee, you can feel the energy. And when every when you're sit when you're there with with people that are aligned with the same types of things that you're thinking, and everybody's there for the same common goal, mm -hmm. it's man, it is energizing. It yeah. makes you want to, you know, makes you want to fight. You know, you get in there and 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 you sit there on the Senate floor and you watch how politics truly works and you know, how the games are played and, and you're there to have your message heard and they push you off, but yet you come back because you don't give up, you know, and you're, you're, you're not going to just lay down and die. We're not just a group of dumb fishermen. So, you know, this is what we're passionate about. We're not going to stop fighting. So, you know, to, to, to get involved with it at that level, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it's definitely, you know, I want to say it's life changing, but it's it it definitely puts different things into perspective for you very quickly. Yeah, I mean, we took the hits in our younger years in 16 and 17 and 18. We took the hits. We were told we didn't know what we we're talking about. We were ra railroaded constantly. Now that hat means a lot, a lot more than just a cool hat. Now you put that hat on and go sit on any congressman's office or any senator's office and they immediately respect you. Because we did that. They know that we know what we're talking about. They know that we're not going to go away. They know that we're passionate and that we're going to hold them accountable. And we did that. We And I, and I don't mean like me and my buddies. I mean, all of us, all of us that have gotten involved, Matt, all, all the people who, who wear the hat every single day, That that's how we do this. Um, it's just a hat, but it's way more than a hat. A lot I need, how do we get one? And go to <laughs> captainsforcleanwater.org, baby. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well, everyone, um, Hannah, please head on over to Canvas for Clean Water. Bang, this has been really inspiring. Truly. Really very, very cool stuff. Um, like I said, I'm gonna contact, you know, our mark our marketing people and our videographers they work with and see if we can tell some really cool stories. Um, I feel like I like to think of it this way. Um, I've been very lucky in my life. You know, we've built quite a community of offshore people. And I always told myself that they you know, have one day you know, Billfish makes it something big and we're far from there. But we've gone some some way, some ways that way. Um, we'll kind of, as a token of gratitude, do whatever we can to make the world better and use whatever influence and capital if we end up making it or following, which we have right now going for us and use that for the better, yeah. right? And not just drive sales. That's not who we are. You know, yes, we are sir. by fishermen for fishing. It's always what we've been, right? So that's what we always will be. Um, so yeah, um, we have a offer which is hired in Delray. So, you know, when this podcast is done, we'll come together and um, we'll see what we can do in that area. That way it's kind of close and we'll, we'll get a story going. Awesome. I'm in, man. Thank you so much for having me. Matt, you're the man. I, I appreciate it. And No um, problem. Leo, do not hesitate, man. Call me, email me, text me, whatever you need. I'm there. Yeah, really touching, dude. It really, I um, like, awesome. Just really awesome. Yeah, man. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. All Thanks, right. Leo. Thank you, man. Appreciate right. you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.